Oh man, this changes things. Hey, what's going on fellas? Welcome back to the channel. I'm your host, Paul, and I just finished up some live fire with the uh, Primary Arms latest LPVO, the SLX 1 to 6 with a Nova reticle. So uh, all you guys must have seen the same video that I saw with our launch video, because as soon as that dropped, man, I got a ton of DMs saying, hey man, review this optic as soon as possible. So uh, thanks to the good folks at Primary Arms, I was able to get an early look at one of these. And after having some time here on the range with it, uh, I can tell you that for sure, this is a huge upgrade from their Gen 3. And maybe this could be the new default choice for a lot of shooters looking for their first 1 to 6 LPVO. Now, when we're talking about comparing to their Gen 3, uh, some things haven't changed with this new Gen 4. Like for example, their profile is about the same. So it's about the same length, about 10 inches. So it's about average. As far as weight, it comes in at just a little over an ounce heavier than the Gen 3, but still just under 18 ounces. So I think that's still more towards the lower end when you compare this against other one to six LPVOs. Also unchanged is actually this scope comes in a 30 millimeter scope body. So that leaves you a lot of mounting options. As you guys know and have seen on this channel we like using the warren scope mounts for the qd lovers so if you need qd and you really want rigid and good um, scope rings the, these have it also these are reasonably priced as well but if you want to save maximum weight then maybe look at something like the aero precision 30 millimeter ultralights we've used those on the channel plenty and that would work on this combo as well so with that out of the way with the initial stuff out of the way let's take a look inside and let's actually take the glass and we'll talk to dot brightness next so this glass that's on this gen 4 is significantly better than the Gen 3. It's actually right up there with some of the mid-tier glass. So when I'm gonna dial it down to one, when I take a look at this for the first time, what I'm looking for is, I wanna see how clear it is as it pushes out toward the edge and when it starts to get distorted. It is very clear in the center and it stays that way almost all the way to the edge, maybe to the last 15% or so is when it only, is when it gets warpy toward the edges. So that's really good for a scope in this price range. And while we're talking 1X, uh, one other thing you'll notice is this really wide field of view. So pairing that with its relatively thin bezel, this optic has a relatively flat sight picture profile. So if you're looking for red dot performance, really similar to a Vortex Razor, this is gonna come very close. Now at 120 feet at 1X, that exceeds 110 feet or so of the Gen 3, and it's very noticeable. And that even exceeds the Vortex PST. So as a reminder, the PST had Philippines-based glass, and this SLX Gen 4 still has Chinese-based glass. So before, this version, if you heard Philippines based glass, that was always a clear winner above Chinese. But now having looked through this, I can see that the gap has shrunk considerably. Like if you were to look through this right here and compare it against the PST, I would be, I would have a hard time choosing which one of these optics has the better glass. And in fact, if you compare it to the PST, I think the PST actually has a little bit more distortion toward the outside than the primary arm, which is surprising. And considering, like I said, it's got a really thin bezel, I think it's actually a little bit flatter looking on the primary arm than the PST, probably because it has a wider field of view. So when it comes to eye box and eye relief, uh, I think the specs between the two, as far as eye relief, is within 0.2 inches of each other. So not a big difference between the two. I mean, when you get your eye behind it, I mean, there's plenty of of eye relief on either, four inches of eye relief, so it's plenty. And I found the eye box for side to side movement on both was very comfortable at both at 1X and 6X on both. So I don't think that's the deciding factor. However, we if you were to hand me both optics side, side by side and said, hey, pick one in, in terms of eye box, I think the PST is slightly more comfortable because it has a little bit more tolerance on left and right movement, but it's not a huge, you know, advantage to the PST. By the way, since we're talking about zooming up, when you're making a your zoom from one to six X, I didn't see any uh, signs of scope tunneling. So the actual movement of the magnification is very uh, accurate and responsive. I also want to note that before you get to maximum zoom, as you're cranking it from one to six X, when you're passing through the middle magnifications, I found those middle magnifications very useful, especially for engaging smaller targets within hundred yards. For example, if I'm shooting off a of VTAC at 40 or 50 yards and I'm shooting at a small A zone six by 12s, once you get to like two or three X, it's a lot more useful than shooting with a red dot. You're more precise and you still have plenty of eye box to work with. So once you get to a maximum magnification, I found the the clarity of the glass, very good, almost edge to edge. So the uh, distortion that we saw at 1X is even less noticeable at 6X. So that's very good. 
And again, if I'm comparing this against the Vortex PST at 6X, I think it's a pretty close match between the two, especially if I'm looking at it in real time. However, now that I look at some of the footage under close zoom, it looks like the PA is a little bit sharper, a little bit more detailed than the PST. And also one more mention about color fringing. I'm not particularly sensitive to it, but I know some people are. So I shot some footage on a uh, high noon day with plenty of sunlight. It was hitting a white background and you have some black lettering for these uh, range markers. Generally, if you see some fringing, it'll be there. So I'm zoomed in here quite a bit here on the test footage. And because of that, you can see some fringing along the right side of these numbers and their white backers. However, if I back out to 6X and I'm just scanning or shooting targets without the zoom, can you really notice it? This is why in practical terms, I think color fringing has never been a big deal with me because it doesn't play a big factor at the magnifications you're dealing with in a typical LPVO. And to the biggest change for the Gen 4 is their daylight brightness. As you guys know that we've dealt with multiple PA scopes on this channel and all we found the feature set really impressive. The one thing they've always fell short on was daylight brightness. So it was always like daylight red is what I called it. So it was like, hey, if I'm gonna look into shadow, I'm gonna use a low light, yeah, turn it on. But during daylight, really, it wasn't any much better than just running a black. PA scopes always had that kind of reputation for me as, as far as LPVOs but not with this scope. So starting with this scope, if you turn this thing to its highest setting at 11, very easy to see this thing on a high noon day and you, for sure you can shoot it at 1X red dot speed. Now, if you, even if you compare it side by side with the PST, actually it looks like it's a little bit brighter than the PSTs. And as far as those brightness settings, even at level 11, there's minimal splashing of that orange illumination. So it doesn't creep out far from the center hash. Also, if you're working indoors with white light, that illumination is still easily visible against the white wall or when you're moving into a darker area. Speaking of which, if you're working in mixed lighting environments, you can even leave it on the maximum setting and it'll work just fine for both the dark areas and the brightly lit areas. If you don't wanna leave it on max though, I think there's plenty enough variation between the settings for you to find your happy medium. So with a wide field of view, thin bezel and bright daylight illumination, I can tell you that it's not a stretch to say that you can shoot this at vortex razor speed at 1X. Even though the razor is a little bit more flat and has less distortion in the corners, uh, there's no reason why you can't perform the same with the PA when it comes to red dot speed. Okay, so now we talked internal quite a bit, let's back out and talk externals now. Okay, so anytime you have a scope that falls into this budget category, you always have to think about, okay, where did I compromise to get to that budget pricing? And when you start looking at some of the external controls, then maybe that fills in some of those blanks. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the turrets. So uh, the good thing about the turrets, they are low profile and cap, which is great. You really need that in an LPVO because typically you don't dial anyway. But speaking of dialing, once you start to play with the turrets, you realize like they're not much of a big upgrade from the Gen 3. So turning the turrets, you don't get a ton of positive feedback. The clicks are kind of tinny sounding. They don't really feel tactile good between the clicks. So what I would say is once you set your zero using those, those clicks, I would put the caps back on as soon as possible to prevent you accidentally bumping into it because I could see your zero changing if you bump into this thing because that thing will not hold, I don't think. Okay, so towards the rear of the scope, this is where you have the diopter. Obviously this works just like any other diopter. It turns really easily. There's a little indicator mark to let you know how far off center you are. So it doesn't lock, but you can visually see that this gets moved and you know where approximately your location is. Given that the field of view is pretty wide at one X, uh, you'll definitely want to adjust this until you, the targets appear flat at 1x, okay? So right in front of that is a zoom ring. Okay, so on the zoom ring, a couple of things. Number one is the actual pressure to turn the zoom ring is actually really stiff. It is actually stiffer than the Vortex PST, if you can believe that. So if you want to turn this thing quickly on the clock, it may loosen over time, I don't know, but I don't think you'll be able to do it super quickly. And then the second thing is it does come with an included throw lever. It's nice that they included that so you don't have to buy one, but the only problem is that they made it small and angular, this right angle, and it's like kind of jagged in places. So if you're like working this really hard with your palm, it's not gonna feel good to jam your palm in this because it's a very uncomfortable feeling. If I'm gonna do a throw lever, here's a little note for scope manufacturers. If you're gonna include a throw lever, there's really only two ways to do it. Uh, you, you make it like big and fat, like those big, uh, like that really cheap breakaway coaster that we run on the uh, Vortex PST, 
or you make it like longer and skinnier with aluminum, like the MGM switch view. That, and those always turn really, really, really quickly. Lastly, on this left side of the scope, this is where you find illumination knob. Uh, we'll talk about the battery cap in just a second. It does go from zero to 11 and it turns pretty easily and you can feel and hear the clicks in between. They line correctly with the number, so not an issue there. Just remember there is no stop there's no opposition in between the level so if you're like at five or something like that and you want to turn it off you need to spin all the way back down to zero just remember it's on zero in order for it to turn off okay um, on the battery cap this is a standard 2032 battery cap the only reason why i mentioned this is uh, primary arm just released the auto live battery cap that lets you add a sense a timer that shuts off and turns on the uh, optic when you pick it up you have to buy the extra it does not come with this optic so when I get that, I'll take a look at it. I'll let you guys know how it works. So guys, in summary, if the controls are a deciding factor for you, and since we were talking to the Vortex PST earlier and comparing it, pretty much everything on the outside is better on the PST. So if that is the deciding factor for you, take that into consideration. So now that we've taken a look at the externals, we're gonna uh, zoom up. And we're gonna take a look at how this thing performs at range. So Primary Arms has uh, several different reticles for this optic. The one that we're using is a Nova reticle, and it's the only one with a processor reticle with mill spacing, and it's got a daylight bright dot, okay? The only other one is the ACSS Aurora. Kind of reminds me of the uh, ACOG TA31, so it has more of a Primary Arms ACSS features that you're used to, like the ranging reticles, the Chevron, etc. But I don't think that one is uh, daylight bright, so just remember to choose this one if you want the daylight bright option. So to take a closer look at the reticle, we'll just zoom into maximum magnification now. And when you're looking at that reticle, it's a crosshair reticle, so the center is gonna be very precise. You can get a very precise zero. And just to the left and right of the crosshair reticle, you have three little dots. They've added a moving target indicators for three, six, and nine miles an hour, I think. I haven't tested any of these moving target ones, so if you guys have done this on a mover, let me know. I'd like to see how they work. So a little bit more about the reticle as you walk down on the bottom. This is a mill space reticle. So the distance between the big hashes is one mil and the distance between the big hashes and the small hashes is 0.5 mils. This does have a little bit of ranging and it has those shoulder width 18 inch markers down the mill, mill hashes. So if you put that on a target, let's just say like it fits on the one mil line then at 18 inches, then you know that target is 300 yards. Having said, I think the only change that I would have made to this reticle for those mill hash lines is I would have liked a little bit of stenciling for labeling, you know, two, four, six, whatever. So you can kind of quickly reference which mill you're looking at when you're shooting it under the clock. So now that we've taken a look at the reticle, the next step is we're actually gonna shoot this on a long distance range. And for that, we need to go to Strelic and get our holds. So here we are in Strelic again to get our holds. As far as uh, test ammo and rifle, uh, we're using uh, Freedom Munition 69 grain reloads going uh, 2650 uh, FPS with a 100 yard zero through our 60 inch uh, Criterion barrel. By the way, we use 100 yard zero just because it's easier on the math, so everything's a holdover, but you can use whatever uh, zero you want just as long as you can plug it into Strelic. And as far as the reticle, uh, this scope is so new that as of right now, it doesn't have the Nova reticle in it. So what you'll need to do is input your target distance to your target, and then Strelic will tell you your holds in mils. So from there, look on the reticle, since it's a mil-based reticle, and count down to your correct mil hash line and hold over or under. For our long distance shoot, we'll be shooting these uh, six inch steel rounds from 232 to 540 yards. So let's see how well it tracks compared to our uh, Strelic holds. 237, one mil. Hit. 300. Second mil right on it. Hit. Hit. What, 40 third mil? Hit. Nice one. 540. Fourth mil. Yes. All right, fellas, so for final thoughts on this, for $340, do you really have to think that hard about this? I mean, considering like, if you follow this channel for a while, uh, you had to spend a minimum of $600 or so for the Vortex PSD to have a really, you know, a good scope with a daylight bright reticle, and that kind of held true for like years, right? But now, with this release, that has significantly disrupted the entry level and maybe some of the mid-tier LPVO market. Because now you can outfit like multiple rifles with this and you can have a good option for all of them, right? 
So really, Primary Arms has done an excellent job with the scope. I knew they were working on it for a while now, but now that I actually had it in my hands and, and I played with it a little bit, I was, you know, had my expectations exceeded quite a bit. So I think this is the LPVO one to six to beat in this price range and maybe a little bit more. And I don't think you'll be disappointed in the scope at all. So I hope that helps. That's it for me. Uh, if you found this video helpful, please leave a like and comment. And if you're interested in equipment, please uh, check the links below. Thanks for checking out this channel and this video, and I'll see you guys again next time.